So you claim to have a novel and human-like approach to your robots that perform these surgeries. Talk to us about how the technology works. So our technology uh, is incredibly unique in the way the actuators themselves work. So with every other surgical robot, they're, they're all built on either legacy technology that has what's called coupled motion that limits the, uh, the motion between the joints and actually causes motion and force coupling between each of the joints, or flexible robots, which have incredibly low forces. Uh, and are, are far too large for a lot of surgical applications. So with these decoupled actuators, we're able to put far more motion inside of the body. We put wrists, elbows, and shoulders, giving the surgeon full motion all through a single 15-millimeter incision. So talk to us about the demand you saw through the pandemic. I assume there was great demand to have robots in the operating room if they could replace a human. And then how does that evolve post-pandemic, given there's been a push towards this generally, but obviously there's not necessarily the need out of a pandemic. Yeah, so I think overall the field of surgical robotics has uh, has had, you know, a, a pretty good amount of demand, as you noted, but there's been demand for a long time to exceed what a surgeon can do with their own hands. Surgeons, you know, put a, a ton of time and effort into not, not just training on what they need to do on the organs, but actually training on how to use the tools, how to learn the techniques, how, how to overcome the challenges and limitations of their limited access to the organs where, where they want to operate. So our device and our technology greatly expands what the surgeon is actually able to do, all while causing far less injury to the patient. And that's why the FDA, as you noted, granted us a breakthrough device designation. Uh, so we, we expect there to be significant demand for better quality of care at, at, while injuring the patient less for a long time to come. You worked at Apple on iPhone manufacturing back in the day. How have you applied what you learned at Apple to Vicarious? Yeah, so both uh, myself and actually uh, our CTO, uh, uh, Sammy Khalifa, and, and co-founder uh, worked at Apple. Sammy worked on, on iPhone product design, uh, focusing on a lot of those small mechanisms that have become incredibly relevant as we design tiny mechanisms inside of our robotic arms and actuators, and he leads our entire R&D effort today. Uh, in my experience with uh, operations and, uh, and manufacturing and high volumes has, has really helped us more than anything focus over the last seven years that we've been inventing and developing this technology to bring it where it is today on, on cost, manufacturability, and, and sort of a practical approach overall. Why did you choose the, the SPAC route versus the other options out there? That's a really good question. So I think there's, there's sort of two questions in that, right? There is both why go public versus stay private and why SPAC versus traditional IPO. Uh, from private versus public perspective, I think it's a pretty easy choice for us. We're incredibly excited to be a public company. It gives us the level of visibility and the ability to be transparent with, with everybody, not just potential investors, but also future customers, employees, as we grow our, our company uh, significantly with the, this transaction. Uh, so we are really excited to have, uh, to have that visibility that comes with being a public company. Uh, from a SPAC versus traditional IPO standpoint, I mean, we, we are pre-revenue today. And I, I do believe, you know, SPACs have a, a very unique place in the world that is especially valuable okay. where a uh, especially valuable given the, the background of technology that we have in the seven years of, um, of development and their ability to come in and okay. validate that and do diligence on it.